a cool thing about Abraham was that um, he would never um, pitch tent. He would only build altars. Then he would keep moving. Amazing, huh? He would, he would go from place to place. God would tell him to go. And when he would go, he wouldn't go and pitch tent and say, okay, now I'm going to settle here. He would keep moving. He would come to a place. God would say, stay a while. And he'd stay a while. He'll, he'll build an altar. Once he builds the altar, he'll find out something about God. And so he would recognize God as Yahweh Jaira or Yahweh Shama. And he would recognize who God was and he would build an altar there. And once he discovered what he was supposed to discover about God there, he would move on. And then he would, uh, God would ask him to stop somewhere else and he'd stop there and he would build an altar again. And so his, his life was basically moving from, hey Stephen, moving from one place to the other without uh, pitching tent. And, and that is how we are supposed to be there. One of the things that happens to us is we get born again and then we make some movement, even attend a life group and then pitch tent. Because now we've even attended a life group. You are now among the top 20% of the church because 80% doesn't attend a life group. So now that we've achieved this, we pitch tent. When God is saying, but I never meant you to pitch tent. I always want you to build altars, discover who I am, keep moving because I've got new places to take you to. See, Lot would pitch tent. Lot decided, this is it. I'm going to pitch tent here. When you settle, here's what happens. In Christianity, whenever you settle, your offspring will persecute the pioneers later. Lot ends up sleeping with his daughters, without knowing, produces children who later on turn against Israel and do them harm. This is one religion where settling is not allowed because it always produces offspring that persecutes the movers later. So decide in your mind that it doesn't matter how well I'm doing. I might be the top 3% of the church, but I refuse to settle because there's nothing about this religion that demands settling. It's always about moving into greater things of God. And because God is infinite, you will never reach a point where you can say, ah, got it all. And so today what we're going to talk about is, oh God, how do I keep spiritually moving and what are the benefits of moving? What are the benefits of migrating? What are the benefits of moving? Because at the end of the day, what are we talking about? We're talking about moving into a spiritual position that is in the present will of God. And the thing is, if you want your destiny to be unlocked, and all of us are hung up on destiny and purpose, but here's the thing. If you want destiny or purpose to be unlocked, you have to confront the unfamiliar. Anything that must be unlocked in your life will not be unlocked till you step into something unfamiliar. And that is why we love hearing messages on destiny and purpose and dream big and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, you can't dream big if you don't confront something unfamiliar. Once you are in something unfamiliar and things are not what they used to be, now things begin to open up. It's always like that. Da. Take the life of any hero from Hebrews chapter 11. And at some point, they came into the unfamiliar and God happened. And so spiritual migration of moving with the Spirit of God requires that. And your willingness to actually engage in this kind of movement will actually prolong your life. The potency of your life and the span of your life increases when you are willing to keep moving with God. Many people die early because they're not going to be any earthly good anyway, so why not take them to heaven? Because a point comes in my life where God will say, I had written days for you. I had numbered days for you. I had plans for you. But now that you have taken the last 60 years of your life not doing anything, it is impossible for you to accomplish in the next 20 years what you actually were supposed to start 30 years ago. So son, why don't you come home? Why did Jesus die at 33? Part of the reason was because there was nothing else left to do. He finished everything. There was nothing else left to do. What a great thing to write on your uh, gravestone, huh? Here lies Jacob John. There was nothing else left to do. 
That's such a cool thing to say, man, on someone's grave. But how many of us will see that, huh? I think of the years I've wasted, and one of my prayers is, Father, help me to catch up. So that by the time I left, I leave the earth, you'll be able to say, boy, he finally got to the end. Because we put, he fought the good fight of faith on everybody's grave. Half of them didn't. But we won't go there today. So, we must move with God because our history is governed by the season of, seasons of God. Our history, my history, when I look back at my life, my history should be written based on what God was moving me into. What did I accomplish last year? It must be what God had prepared for me in 2016. I finished it in 2017. Now standing in 2018, I look back and I have a history because of what God wrote and I completed. That should be our desire. And that can only be achieved when you keep moving with him. So here are some of the... So, so, so my question before we go into the benefits of moving with God is are you moving? Are you moving? If you haven't changed in the last two years, question your Christianity. The iPhone has come up with three models in the last two years. It's upgrading. How about you? If Tim Cook can do it, Jesus can do it. So the question is, have you moved? If you look at your life in 2016 December and 2018 December, how much have you changed? What has transpired? Have you moved? That's the first question. Second question is, have you moved with the church? Because God, as much as he deals with you individually, is always looking for a people. He is not looking for individuals. Superstars will disappear soon. God is looking for a people. When he called out Israel, when he called out Abraham, what was his plan? His plan was not that, let me have a superhero call Abraham. No, it was, Abraham, I'll give you children that will become a nation. Because I want to be a God who through a nation will show the other nations of the world what it is when God lives amongst the people. So, if you say you are moving and it is only in your personal Christianity you are moving, then here's the bad news, that ain't movement because God moves a people and if you're not moving with what the church is doing, you're really not moving, you're treading water. I know we don't like hearing this because we all love individualized Christianity, me and my God, but it's just not the way he works. Show me one place in the Bible where he works like that. One place, da. One place in the Bible where God says, it is me and you. It is always me and the people. And amongst the people, he has different things for us to do so that an entire nation left Egypt. Not just Moses. An entire nation. And amongst the nation were 12 tribes. And amongst the 12, 12 tribes were clans. And amongst the clans were families. And amongst the families were individuals. And God is once again looking for a nation called a people who belong to God. Little Christs, Christians. Parts of a body. When the whole body moves, the parts move. When the parts move by, just imagine, uh, suddenly my nose leaves my face and starts walking away. Piece of flesh with some booger in it, nothing else. On this face, it looks really handsome. When it leaves my face, it loses its location, loses its direction, loses its function. It's pointless. So, what are the benefits of migration? What happens if you actually move with God? Guys, the first thing is if you start moving with God, you move to where he is, not where he was. You move to where he is, not where he was. When Israel would see the cloud move, man, you should have seen the activity in the camp if you could have a bird's eye view. They'd be packing because all the tents had to be packed, all the cattle had to be packed. And then Moses would stand on a small hill and he would shout, Arise, O God, let your enemies be scattered. Da, 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 da. Echo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and then all of Israel would get up and they would begin their movement across the wilderness. Why? Because they knew that it didn't matter how nice the oasis was, how shady the palm trees were, and how free the place was. When God is moving, I better move with him because that's how I'm going to get to the place I'm supposed to get to it. 
And so desire movement, because the opposite of movement is this thing called stagnation, which will force you to return to Egypt. So you must get up in the morning and ask God, Father, if not every morning, get up once a month and ask God, Father, what are, how, are, how are things, Father, in my life? What do you want to change, O oh God? How much am I really moving? How have things gotten Kalivali? Kalivali is a Greek word which means eh, eh, which is a Hebrew word which means totally settled. So the point is that we got to ask God, Father, could you take me around? Because you have to be where God is. That's not a cliche, it actually carries a lot of meaning. Because Abraham had amazing sight, amazing access, simply because of his migratory patterns. He would follow God. And because of that, he had amazing insight into God. This is the man in the Old Testament in whom the Holy Spirit did not dwell. And yet he came up with more names of God than anybody else. He's an Old Testament guy and he gets mentioned in the New Testament more than most people. Why? Because he had this access and insight into God because of his migratory patterns. He would follow God wherever he, God told him to go. Hebrews 11.8, not knowing where he was going, he went. We've put too much of an emphasis on I need to understand. You don't need to understand, you need to obey. So what if you don't understand? God didn't say, love me and understand me. He said, love me and obey me. <laughs> if you love me, you will understand me. No doubt. If you love me, you will obey me. So when I say something, you don't have to figure it out. You just have to start walking. This is moving with God. And this prevents stagnation. While you're walking, you will find that your leprosy is healed and understanding comes. If I want to understand it first, I might get healed, but I won't re return to the healer. Second, if you move, hey, by the way, you cannot move, you cannot participate in the specific if you don't start with the generic. What I mean is, oh God, show me your way, oh God, show me your way, Lord, just personally talk to me, oh God, show me your way. And God is saying, hey, every week, every Sunday I'm showing your way through some of the guys who speak like I'm doing through this guy. You want your own personal letter from God. But when God gives a generic letter, we don't want to follow it. It's just a highly individualized Christianity. Da. We want specific instructions without following the generic instructions. God will always give the generic instruction first. If you agree with that and participate in that, then he will give the specific direction. There's no way of escaping this, huh? Just like clouds bring rain, Jesus could have sent rain through leaves, through birds. He could have created rain any which way he wanted. He decided that there'd be these things called clouds and the clouds will bring rain. He decided it, so it will be. Just the same way he has decided that I will work through a people and once you connect to a people, I will start giving you specific instructions. When I isolate myself from the body, and think that I'm a microcosm of who God is, as in I'm complete by myself, that is an anathema to the church because Jesus says the body of Christ is made up of parts and your significance comes from what you are a part of. All I'm saying is, guys, if you want to move, you will have to find a church that is moving with God. And if this isn't that church, leave this church and find another church. But if this is the church, then you must participate in what God is doing in this body if you want to move with him into the places that he wanted to take you to and that he designed before the foundations of the earth. And Chota Amin will be very encouraging. Thank you. After every point, I'll ask for an amen so I can move on to the next one with great encouragement. The second thing is, if you want to migrate, uh, I mean, if you start moving with God, you will find that you will finally enter the promises of God. God gives us promises through the prophetic. God gives us promises through the Bible. 
But if we don't start moving with God on a daily basis, you will find that those promises don't come to pass. And like the tribe of Gad and Reuben, you settle on the wrong side of the Jordan, never entering into the fullness of the promise. So every time God sends me a promise, be it through the prophetic or be it through his word or be it through someone who comes and gives me advice, I write it down and then it is, oh God, show me how to move with you into what you have promised so that I arrive there in the window that you have created. God creates windows of time for people to step into things. That's why in the Bible you'll always hear this phrase, in the fullness of time. What does he mean by in the fullness of time? I had planned something. This was the time appointed for it. I'm planning to do this. Will you join me? Because if you come in now, the way will be easy. And when we don't, then we spend 15,000 days in the desert instead of spending 15 days in the desert. 40 years is about 15,000 days. So if you want to step into the fullness of the promises that people across this room have received, ask God, Father, teach me how to put my hand in your hand, Abba, and walk with you because you can take me into those places. But I'm not going to sit here waiting because I am a person who desires to be where you are because I refuse to stagnate. Guys, the greatest enemy of Christianity today is stagnation. With stagnation will come dullness. After dullness will come deception. And coming to church for two hours on a Sunday is the perfect medicine. Not perfect medicine, perfect trap for stagnation. Because we come to this church, um, Sunny Prasad leads worship, feel really vibrant, Amazing preaching. Amen? (laughs) And then we go home and and we think, ah, feel like I'm moving with God. No, no. You sat throughout the entire time. And you heard a good thing and you went and nothing happens. This is not moving. We've got to move that. Otherwise, this place will stagnate. Third thing. If you want to move with God... If you start moving with God, you will experience growth. You will experience growth. The thing is, sometimes God likes you so much that if you aren't moving, he will send a wave that will make you move. I prefer moving on my own. Because when God sends a wave, there is rarely a warning. I only realize it's a wave when it's under me. How do you know there's an elephant under your bed? Your nose touches the ceiling. That's completely not relevant. But the (laughs) But I think it's funny. But the point is this, guys, that at the end of the day, if you don't move, God has put so much in you and likes you so much that he will shake your foundations so that you move. And especially in a church like this, expect it because much is being poured into you. Much is being poured into you. And after two or three attempts of sending a wave, if you still are not moving, then I don't know what will happen. But God will try. And he's done this in my life. eh, where Whenever I got stagnant, first he will send someone to encourage me. Won't work. Then he'll send someone to give me a word that will frighten me. It'll work for two days. Then he will send someone with another word and encouragement to move me, won't move. Then God will say, okay, Jacob, like you too much, put too much in you, I got to do something which will knock your settled foundations so that you can once again turn to me and run with me. And I'm grateful that God does that, eh? I'm grateful God does that. Because otherwise, my dad used to say this. God, I mean, God has put so much in in you that he wants more. My dad, my f- earthly dad used to say this. He used to say, Mone, I have fed you so much that you better become taller than me. Because he kept seeing me expand this way and he would say, when are you going to grow this way? And finally, when I turned 16, I became taller than him, which is not a big deal because he was quite short. But the point is this, that God has put too much in you and he's demanding of you that, hey, give me my dues. Isaiah 5 has this really sad song that God sings. And it goes like this. It says, tell me, O my people, what what more could I have done? When I planted a choice vine, why is it that you have produced sour grapes? 
Can't afford it, da. The next thing you do if you move with God is that, uh, hey, moving with God will require that you sometimes give up your friends and your comfort. Huh? Very hard thing to do. Part with your relatives, part with your family, part with your friends. Not easy. But I would rather move with God than stick with my relatives. And they're nice relatives, but I would rather move with God. Nothing else should become a priority. priority da. Hey, why is this important? Because just think of the options. Huh? Just think of the options. If I don't move with him, the only choice is to stagnate. And when I stagnate, I will always go back to Egypt because the leeks and the cucumbers of Egypt are far better than stagnation. It is impossible for Christianity to settle and thrive. There is nothing about Jesus that is not constantly about change. Come to me as you are. Sing that song while you're coming up. But after you come to me, change. We should add an extra verse to that song. Just as I am, I come, I come. But then after that, it's now that I have come, I change, I change. So remember that the demand on you is, will you leave your place of comfort? Will you leave your present position and job when God says, hey, I got something else for you? God will not send you to Africa if you're asking to go to England. God doesn't do stuff like that. We're always scared to ask God for anything because we think he's going to give us exactly the opposite. Yet he himself said, if you ask for an egg, will I give you a scorpion? Why do you think I'll send you somewhere you don't want? I'll prepare your heart before I send you. I won't, I won't push you into things that you're not ready for. The next thing is once we start moving with God, Whenever there's migration, whenever there's spiritual migration, there is greater access to revelation. Whenever there is spiritual migration, there is greater access to revelation. As in, the moment Peter moved from the position that the disciples held to a statement that had never been made in the world, revelation came. What do I mean by that? When you read Matthew 16, verses 16 onwards, Jesus asks a question, and he's asking all the disciples a question. Here's what he's asking them. Who do they say I am? He isn't asking Peter. He's asking everybody there. People keep saying different things. One says, some say you're a prophet, others say you're a teacher. And Jesus says, but who do you say I am? Nobody says anything, eh? And then Peter steps up and he says, you and it's the first time anyone's making that statement about a man on the face of the earth. He says, you are Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus turns to him and says, this revelation did not come from the earth. It came from the father. And therefore, I now give to you the keys of the kingdom. Whenever you move with God, God will keep opening up who he is so that you have a greater idea of oh shucks father I didn't know this about you and as you begin to realize who he is you'll find that you are able to open doors which you previously could not open because God is now giving you access it's the same in any company you start in a company you start as a junior guy as you begin to learn the ways things work and as you begin to learn how your boss likes things you you find that you have more knowledge. What happens when you have more knowledge? You begin to open more doors. You begin to open newer levels. Doesn't matter whether you're playing a video game or whether you belong to a company. It's the same thing. This is why we can sit year after year after year listening to really good sermons, but there is a dullness. And why does that dullness happen? Because we have stagnated. With stagnation will come dullness. After dullness will come deception. And what is the deception? That I know everything. I don't need to learn anything more. What can you teach me? You better be impressive. Next one. Guys, once you start moving, uh, only then... Is there any chance that you might get a double portion? We love praying this prayer. Huh? Oh, give me a double portion. Give me a double portion. Double portion is not given to everybody. Da. 
There was this guy called Leonard Ravenhill. He's a very well-known preacher who died some years ago. When he was dying, students from the Bible college would come to him and they'd say, could you, uh, they would tell his son, David Ravenhill, hey, David, could you ask your dad to lay hands on me and pray that I get a double portion of his anointing? And Leonard Ravenhill said to his son, they all want my mantle, but nobody wants my sackcloth. Everyone wants a double portion, but nobody wants to pay the cost. There were 51 prophets, at least 51 prophets, who Elijah had raised. And they knew that he was going to die. Out of the 51, one, just one, kept moving from one position to the other. And you could literally do a sermon on how he moved from Bethel to Jordan, Bethel to Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho to Jordan. And finally, because he decided that he would move to where Elijah was moving till he would see God. He was the only one who gets a double portion. The double portion was always given to the oldest son. So if you had 300 rupees, 200 go, would go to the firstborn, 100 would go to the second son. And how, how, how does this work? Prove your sonship there. You want a double portion? Prove your sonship in this house. Prove your sonship in this house. Because all of us can be the father's son easily because he is invisible. Sonship is difficult when we have to operate under someone visible. Easy to follow God. Easy to say sorry to God. But when you do me harm, then it becomes hard for you to come and say sorry to me. Easy to say to the Lord, Father, here is my wallet. Take all the money you want because you know his hand won't come down and take any money from you. Try that with me and I'll show you what will happen to your wallet. <laughs> Very different when we have to submit to someone visible. Anyone wants to try it? <laughs> Not the wallet. <laughs> okay. The point is this, guys, that at the end of the day, if you start moving with God, know that one of the things that will happen is that your sonship will be proven because God will put you under Elijah's. God will put you under Paul's. God will put you under Abraham's who will run and you will start running with them because at the end of the day, part of moving with God requires following people. We have this idea that the Holy Spirit will teach us directly. Really bad idea, by the way. The Holy Spirit always uses people. Jesus had to be put in a family. Why? Why couldn't Jesus just automatically be really good Jesus? Didn't happen that way. He had to be put in a family with a father and a mother. This is the son of God being put in a family with a father and a mother so that he could learn obedience. Someone had to instruct him. Preach to me, but don't instruct me and don't tell me to obey. Doesn't work, da. This is why attending life groups, even though the leader may be really cranky and the material may be boring, is important. Because that is how you learn to submit to people because the Holy Spirit works through people. When I hear people come and say, oh, the Holy Spirit teaches me everything. I think to myself, you have learned nothing. Because it is always through people. Anything that I am today, I owe to people in my life. I owe to people in my life. Who took the time to instruct me. Who protected me, who encouraged me. Who were upset with me. I pray God that you find that in a big church like this because there are tons of fathers and sons in this church. It's just that we don't like the idea. We won't talk about fathers and sons today, but it's such a brilliant thing. Eh? One of the most amazing things, 8 minutes, 50 seconds. One of the most amazing things that happened at the church that I pastor was when I moved from being a pastor to being like a father. When I was a pastor, I had members. When I became a father, members began to turn into sons and daughters. Change the nature of the church. Huh? Where your desire as a pastor is, I want to raise a strong church. Your desire as a father is, I want to raise a family of strong sons and daughters who can go and pour out their lives and die. 
As a pastor, you want people to increase but not go beyond you because then you will send them to Bihar on a mission trip. As a father, you want your children to do better than you. And there are thousands of fathers and sons in this church waiting to be trained. Would you please step up? Because it says in, Isaiah, in Psalm 46 or 48, it says, The sons shall stand in the place of their fathers. Everything we do must be generational. God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Makes sense, know what I'm saying? Noah. Makes sense to the first three rows. Hey, if possible, go and listen to this again, because huh? what I'm saying is good. Duh. If we can get this, it'll really help us break out of stagnation. Because huh? it's critical. Because one of the dangers in a large church is that we can disappear, nobody will see us, we can come and attend and go, and we think we are practicing Christianity. No, we are just engaging in two hours of Christian activity. Once you start moving with God, abundance begins to happen. Abundance begins to happen. And what, I, what do I mean by abundance? God releases resources when you begin to move with him. Because where you go, he knows that you will need resources to do what you need to do. I found this out early and I so enjoy it, moving with God. Because I know that if I'm moving with God, the resources for what I do will become available. For sure. Because God allocates resources not based on what you are presently doing, but who he wants you to be and where he wants you to walk. So if he takes you somewhere, God will always supply resources. Really? Is this in the Bible? Yeah. Hey, when, when Israel left Egypt, what did God do? Resourced them for 40 years, man. Gave them 400 years of back pay. Imagine what kind of bonus that was. And who did he send to collect it? Not brave Israeli men, but weak Israeli women going and knocking on the doors of their former masters who had treated them badly. And what did they say when they knocked on the door? Oh, I'm here just to collect the back wages for the last 400 years. And that was sufficient. I don't know how this God works, da. But I assure you, when you begin to move with him, the resources become available. And the resources don't come from your salary. The resources come from your father. If you think resources come from your work, you will only get what you deserve if you are good at your work. It's very hard to live on what you deserve. But when God gives, he always gives you what you don't deserve. And like I said before, God is not very good at math. He had 5,000 people sitting. He multiplied so much fish and bread that there was left over 12 baskets. So he was given a second chance. So now there were 3,000 people. He multiplied it again. Still seven baskets left over. What I'm trying to say is God never gives you just enough. Never. Every time you ask for something and get exactly what you ask for, be suspicious. I often say to God, Father, I asked for this, I got exactly that. Is everything okay between you and me? Because he always gives more. It's his nature. He's never given just enough. He could have put two colors in the rainbow. No. Three. No. Four. No. He put seven. Never just enough. Amazing God. Da. Why wouldn't you move with him? Why wouldn't I move with this amazing God? He is so interesting. He's such a distraction. He is so powerful. He likes you. He is humorous. He's not dull. Fishermen and prostitutes wouldn't hang out with a man who was dull. Try it. Go. Go near, what's that place called? Marina Beach. Go to Marina Beach and look very sad and dull and see how many people come and talk to you, huh? 
this is the God we served up. Got to move with him. Got two more points and then we'll try to figure out, so how do we begin this process? When Israel left Egypt, they were resourced. When the lepers left the gate of Samaria to go to the Syrian camp, it shifted them from poverty to abundance. Somehow, when you start walking with God, because you are where he is, it attracts his favor and resources are always released. Always released. Always released. And step out first. No, don't wait for resources. The worst that can happen is you look really foolish. Both have happened to me. Where I stepped out and fell flat on my face and then got up after some time the face heals and you can start again. But after a while you realize, oh shucks, this actually works. The strange thing is, when Joshua asked the priests to step into the Jordan, remember they had to cross the Jordan? In Joshua chapter 3 verse 15, he asks them to step into the Jordan and nothing happened. The water was still running. Why? Because 80 miles away, in a city called Adam, the water started piling up. Just imagine this. Huh? You've just been told by your general, step into the water and the Jordan will part. You step into the water and everything is the same. One hour goes by, nothing is changing. Two hours go by, you feel it's beginning to go down. But now, by now your feet are frozen. Huh? But you're still standing there. Why? Because the water started piling up in Adam. And so they became a wall 80 miles away. And now that they had stopped, the water started going down till it was dry ground. Hey, wait, man, wait. It always happens. But you can't trust your understanding because when they looked at the water and when they realized that they had lost feeling in their legs, they still didn't leave because God would come through. They had seen it in the Red Sea. They wanted to see it again at the Jordan. God brings you into abundance, allocates resources. I could tell you so many stories, but that clock is clocking. So I've got to move on. <laughs> the other thing is, when you start moving with him, no? He brings you into gladness. Chris, life becomes joyful when you move with God. When you sit in a place and stagnate, it's not much fun there. You always know someone who's stagnant. You can see it on their face. You can see it on their face. But you know the ones who are moving because you can see it on their feet and their face. God brings us into gladness. So one of the things that happens when you, uh, when you migrate or when you move with God is he brings you to gladness. I don't know whether it's John Piper or some guy before him like Tosa who said that the ultimate purpose of God in all his works is joy. The ultimate purpose of God in all his works is joy. If you tweet that, don't use my name because my name is not Tozer. So <laughs> the ultimate purpose of God in all his works is joy. What, what, what does Jesus say when the servants have done well, when everything is complete? Enter into my joy. Enter into my joy. What was Jesus famous for? I have anointed you with gladness that is beyond your brothers. One of the things that happens when you walk and move with God is you go from one place of joy to another because you satisfy him and he satisfies you. It's like father and son who really enjoy each other. Last point. If you refuse to migrate or uh, move, then you will return to Egypt. But if you begin to move with God, you will escape present snares. You will escape present snares. Things that bind you right now in the familiar life that you live will be broken once you decide that, oh God, I want to leave this. I know it's scary. I know it'll be reckless. I know what family and friends will say, but I need to leave this. Oh God, I can't stay here anymore. When the prodigal moved, he escaped poverty. When Israel moved, 
They escaped the oppression of Egypt. When Abraham moved, he escaped the idolatry of the Chaldeans. When Naomi and Ruth moved, they escaped a land of barrenness and came into plenty and got included in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Every time you decide to move, present bondages are broken. Prayer does not break bondages. One has to sow a seed for breakthrough. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about the seed of saying, Oh God, this place of stagnation and bound in. Bring me into a new place. Just tell me how. And so let's just take two ways that we can break out from our present place. One, if you're stagnating, face it and admit it. That's the first thing. You'll have, to, you'll have to admit it. Hey, repentance is a turning of our mind saying, Oh God, I need to change. I repent of my stagnation. You'll have to admit it. It's not so that God hears it. He knows it. But you will have to admit it. So the first step is, Father, I have become stagnant. There's a dullness where I come and do all the Christian things, but I'm not doing out of a living, vibrant, walking relationship. I'm doing it out of practice now. I admit that I'm stagnant. That's the first place. The second place is, Father, you work with a people. You must include me in a people. Teach me how to be included. Teach me how to participate in the life of the body because you don't deal with just the elbow. You deal with the whole body so that the elbow is... Strengthen. The entire body grows together. And if this is not a healthy body, go find another one. There are so many people here, you won't even be missed. Which is a good thing and not a good thing. The point is this. Ask God, Father, please include me in what you're doing in a body because you always work in the body. That's the second part. And then do something about it. Go meet someone because without submitting to human beings, God will not work in your life. Third, Father, what I'm doing is so familiar. Could you please show me some unfamiliarity that I can step into? Begin to show me, Lord. I'll come and ask you every month, Father, what is it that I need to step out of and into? What is it, oh God? What pattern do I need to change? What do I need to change in my marriage so that my marriage moves from stagnation to vibrancy? What do I need to do in terms of my finances so that my finances move from stagnation to vibrancy? Very easy. I can tell you the answer, but I won't. What do I need, oh God, to do with regard to my spiritual life where I'm so stagnated that everything is the same? Very simple answers. Take each part of your life that is stagnant and go to him and he will do it. And then the last bit, the fourth question is, Father, give me a new horizon and a new vision. And I, I said this in the previous service, God is not a cosmic vending machine. You can't pop two hallelujahs and three praise the lords and get an answer. If you want vision from God, it will require you to do what Habakkuk did. Climb up the watchtower. Keep a lookout for God waiting for him. Write down what he says. Make it into simple language so that even your little boy can read it and understand it. Boldly proclaim it. This is how vision is formed. Begin to ask God. Begin to ask God. Every couple of years I'll say, Father, so what is the new impossible life that you want me to step into? How do you know something is from God? You don't have the resources, the ability, the good looks to do it. That is when you know, ah, it's not God. It, it is God. Because everything God gives you. Hey, show me one thing in the Bible that people asked, that God asked people to do, that they could do themselves. One thing. Every time God gives a vision, it is beyond your ability, your resources, your finances. It is beyond you. That is when the stretching begins. That is when the movement begins. And when you're stretched, you give birth. If you're not stretched, I mean, I'm talking about it like I'm an expert at it. I don't know anything about it. But all I want to say is when you're stretched, you give birth. 
And when you're stretched, when someone gets pregnant, the cycle stops and new birth begins. And it's the same in the spiritual. Your old cycle ceases and a new birth begins.